organizing this and giving the opportunity for me to present my talk. Um, so it's kind of unlike, in some senses, unlike what the talks that we've seen previously, because I'm not considering time series data. In this talk, I really focus on spatial data. And to sort of motivate the sort of environment or the, the sort of type of models I'll be looking at or the situation I'm looking at, I want to sort of start with actually some real data. And this is basically a... Um, the ground ozone um, data in the Ohio Valley in the USA. Okay? And, it's, and if you go to anything like the Environmental Protection Agency, you can get this type of data. Um, and the EPA, just for sort of background, are really interested in ground ozone because when the ground ozone is above 70 parts per million, then it's supposed to be considered bad for your health. Okay? Here, we've taken the ground ozone on the 4th of April, and everything's okay. So the highest you level you see is um, 55 parts per million. So it's not, not bad in this case, but if you go towards the summer, it gets worse and worse. Okay, so what do we notice about this data set? What we really have is we have sort of region, so this is sort of longitude and latitude, so an area in the um, Ohio Valley, and each, sort of, each of these squares corresponds to a measurement station. Okay? And at each measurement station, the, um, the ground ozone level has been taken. And so what you observe is that the, the measurement stations are pretty er 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 erratic sort of over the entire place. It's kind of random, you could say that. So the locations are not regularly spaced in any shape or form. So the cent um, central to the analysis of any type of spatial data like this is basically understanding the mechanism, the process, usually we assume it's stochastic, which generates this type of data. And so basically what we really want to do usually is model in some sense the spatial covariance structure for this type of data. And once you do that, then you can do things like Krieging, that means predicting at points, which, um, locations which are unobserved. Okay. Um, so there is very rich literature, I, I don't know everything about this, on, on sort of trying to analyze this type of data and looking at the covariance function in particular. So there are sort of two ways of going about it. You can do something like non-parametric covariance estimation or parametric covariance estimation when you're trying to estimate the, the underlying covariance function. There are many non-parametric methods, but the most classical is looking at the variogram. And this is really looking at an L2 distance between between the, um, the, um, the, um, the, the process at two different points over here. And from, from the variogram, then you can try to estimate the covariance under certain conditions. So this is the, this is the one that, um, you know, the people in spatial, they absolutely love. Um, there is another way, which is actually kind of popular too, is that you're trying to estimate the covariance non-parametrically, so you do you think some sort of kernel smoother. Okay? But the problem is if you do it every single um, location, the, the covariance estimate you get may not be, um, may not be a sort of a um, semi, semi um, non -neg negative definite function. So the, um, so the method proposed by Peter Hall and his collaborators was estimate it non parametrically, then take the Fourier transform of that. Anything that's negative, you put to zero and then Fourier transform back. Okay? So computationally, it's kind of very tough to do. So really, you have to somehow gridify the whole setup. So these are sort of pa classical parametric procedures that there exists software for. Um, there are also many parametric procedures too. Um, one is a likelihood approach, and there are many ways of going about it, but I think Mike Stein is sort of the leader in this, and he has this composite likelihood, etc. And there's even spectral estimation methods, which is close to what we're going to be looking at here, and um, Fiontes um, has hers in 2007, and then there's a very nice procedure proposed by Matsuda and Yajima in 2009. And, and then, of course, the, what I've discussed above really assumes in some sense a stationarity or maybe intrinsic stationarity. So this assumption also needs to be checked and, and, and a nice method was proposed by uh, co my colleague uh, McYoung John. Okay, so this is, this is the sort of a sort of quick summary of classical spatial procedures and, and, and essentially how these procedures, um, these procedures work very well and their sampling properties are kind of well understood. But if you look at them, there's no real coherency in the methodology. So the non-parametric covariant procedure is, is completely different to the parametric um, estimation procedure. So really, in some sense, the purpose of my talk is sort of to develop a sort of a unified um, sort of approach to sort of tackling some of the problems I've described to you above in looking at this um, covariance function. Um, the idea is hopefully we'll get statistics which have good statistical properties and also are computationally feasible because we are in the world of big data and when your spatial um, number of spatial numbers is in, in the thousands, you want it to actually compute it in somehow real time. So 
the motivation for the method I look at, it actually comes from time series analysis. So this is the sort of link to the workshop over here. Um, a, lot of, a lot of parameters of interest in time series can really be written in terms of functional, the spectral density function. Okay, so, so it's a very nice paper by Dahas and Yanis, which sort of try to estimate the variance in this type of setup over here. So what we have is basically spectral density function, and how you choose your function phi determines the, um, the parameter you're trying to estimate. Okay, so a whole class of estimators can be sort of written in this type of this form over here. But of course, we don't know this parameter, so we, have to, we don't know this parameter over here, so we have to estimate it. Um, so the way we go about it is, we, of course, we assume that the time series is stationary, and then to estimate this parameter, we, um, we replace the spectral density function by a crude estimate of it, which is the, basically the periodogram. So we get the, peri we get the Fourier transform, and the DFT of the time series, we take the absolute square of it, that's the periodogram, and then we take just um, the, sum, the average sum over it. And, and the hope is really is that this quantity over here, this sort of estimator over here, estimates the parameter for a given phi. Okay? So things I just want to highlight, of course, here is that how we take the frequencies, the frequencies we use are basically 2 pi k over 2 t, and these are called the Fourier frequencies. And so what we want to do is, is it, is it possible to sort of generalize this approach to spatial data when the locations are completely irregular? C can we do that? That's really the idea of this talk. So, so what we're going to do is try to, in some sense, define the Fourier transform in analogous way to time series, and then using that, define a class of estimator statistics. So to sort of tackle some of the problems I described to you earlier, and given this sort of class of statistics, we want to um, obtain and, and sh look at the mean, what is it actually estimating, look at the variance, okay, are we going to get some like mean squared consistency? And we're going to look at also the situation that the process underlying spatial random field is Gaussian versus non-Gaussian. Because in this setup over here, you get very different type of properties. And then we're going to sort of do some sort of CLT. And of course, underlying all this is that we have a variance, which is actually quite difficult to estimate in practice. But we sort of, we look at a sort of trick for estimating that variance under certain conditions, which is computationally very simple to do. And finally, um, I give a sort of small flavor of how the proofs work. They're particularly technical, but I'll try to sort of make it simpli sim sort of a simplified approach to how to do the proofs. Okay, so let me sort of, sort of explain to you in a couple of slides the setup, so the asymptotic setup, what I'm assuming about the, the variables I'm considering. So basically what we have is a spatial random field over RD, Okay, but it's only observed a finite number of locations. And the locations we're going to know by SJ, and there are N of them. And they're basically going to be on some um, um, lambda, school, lambda cube. That's what we, call what we observe. All right? So we're observing ZSJ at the locations SJ, and we have N of them. For this talk, we're going to assume that SJ are IID random variables. So that's what's giving the randomness, that the locations are somehow irregular, the randomness over here, and that they are, of course, independent of the underlying process that we're observing. So there's no feedback going on. Okay. We're also going to be assuming, so that we're assuming that the process is covariant stationary. In fact, we're going to look mainly at the Gaussian case, but we're assuming that it's covariant stationary. Um, I want to add that if you sort of try to non stationify this, um, uh, this random field, then the properties we get here are very, very different. So you can, you can do it, but you get very, very different um, properties in the non stationary setup. Okay, and then there's the asymptotic formulation, which I've and had to sort of briefly describe to you. So in time series, it's kind of clear. If you're stationary, you just assume that the time increases. Okay? But when you have this irregular sampling in a spatial random field, it's not entirely clear how one should go around about doing the asymptotics. So there are sort of several ways to do the asymptotics. One is a mixed domain asymptotics, and this is going to be the main focus in this, in this talk here. And that means we have observations in a, in a lambda square, essentially, and we're going to let lambda grow to infinity. But then we also have the number of observations in that lambda square, and there are n of them. And so we're going to let n grow to infinity too, but we're going to put a restriction on the rate, essentially that the number of observations in that square grows to infinity at a slightly faster rate than, than the lambda goes to infinity. And this is known as mixed asymptotic. So we're getting denser and denser sampling as we increase the random field. And there is, of course, pure increasing domain asymptotics. And that's basically where lambda, size of random field, and n also go to infinity. But the ratio between the two, this ratio over here, 
it goes to some sort of fixed constant, which basically means that you're not assuming more and more denser sampling. And essentially, that we're going to focus on the mixed domain, all the results I ho tell you in the Gaussian case absolutely hold between the two. Pretty much all the expressions hold except for one extra bias. Everything the same, but some intriguing things happen. If we relax the assumption to the non-Gaussian case, then you actually get some rather stark differences when you're dealing with these two different asymptotics, which is really kind of unpleasant in some sense. And then, of course, there's another, I want to briefly mention, there's another sort of asymptotic formulation. And in this formulation, you say, okay, well, letting lambda grow to infinity is just unrealistic. So you keep the spatial domain fixed, and you assume sort of more and more observations on that spatial domain. So it's known as fixed domain asymptotics. But in the, this setup over there, you cannot really prove any CLT. It's really not possible to get CLT out. But you can use what we have done to obtain the, an expression for the bias. So, but with the mixed domain is really what we're going to speak to anyway. OK, so now what we have to do is, in order to define this sort of class of estimates, we need to know, OK, what do I mean by a, a Fourier transform? Um, Unlike time series, it's not really clear how you should, there's no unique way of defining the Fourier transform. But what we do here is we look at the approach given by uh, Matsuda Yajima, and also at the same time Lahiri, they both sort of define the Fourier transform in, in this special way over here. It's a very sort of natural way of doing it. Here is your spatial random process over here, a location SJ, and you take the exponential of that, and then you just basically standardize lambda d over n, the number of observations. Okay, and, and I just want to mention that Masry, in a, in a nice IEEE paper in 1978, did something very, very similar for Poisson sampling as well. So, so this should be um, sort of noted over here. Okay, now we, have the, now we have our Fourier transform, and this Fourier transform is defined for all omega belong to Rd. So of course, computationally, you, can, you cannot evaluate this Fourier transform for every single Rd. So what you want to do is basically say, okay, can we gridify Rd in some sort of way that we do not lose any information about our Fourier transform? Can we find a good gratification of it? So that's kind of it. So what we want to do is find that analogous version of the Fourier frequencies in time series now for, um, for irregular locations, when we have irregular locations. So what I explain here is that you, you can, if you do it in this way, so this is my crude um, low-tech diagram. So what we have over here is, here is my spatial random field. And, and at, re at regular locations, and I'm going to sort of take the Fourier transform, and I'm going to look at a specif specific grid. And the grid is the distance between each point on the grid is 1 over lambda. Okay? So I'm looking at my Fourier transform at, one over lambda, at sort of 1 over lambda on this grid. So as lambda gets bigger and bigger and bigger in my spatial domain, in my Fourier domain, I look, I'm basically, I have it divided over Rd, it's a grid of Rd, but the grid frequencies get closer and closer. Okay, so this is basically the grid I'm going to be looking at. And then the question is, why does this grid, is it special? What does it have for helping us here? So to do that, to d look at the properties of the Fourier transform, I need to sort of place some assumptions on my spatial process and also my locations. So the first thing I do is I'm assuming something, a short memory type of assumption on my spatial random field. So I have my covariances, I'm assuming stationary, so the covariance at this point here, covariance at this point here, the, um, the correlation between the covariance decays at a rate fa oh, faster than, than some Euclidean distance to minus, tw minus 2 plus delta. So it's, it's something a bit, fast, um, a bit stronger than short memory condition on that. So that's my condition on the spatial process. And then I have... Remember, my, the way I am modeling the irregular locations is assuming that they're IID random variables. So what I'm, going to, oops, what I'm going to assume on here is that essentially they have a certain spatial uh, density. So I have a density on, on the, on the, for the irregular locations. And as I lambda go to get bigger, I'm sort of stretching out that density. That's a sort of tool for me to do the asymptotics, sometimes similar to rescale asymptotics. So that's my tool. Okay? So in this case over here, it allows like uniform sampling. So where you know, every, every point has equal chance of being um, taken, or sort of clustering. And the, my, my condition on my location density is the following. This is, the, this is my sort of technical condition that I'm going to be using, that when I do my Fourier representation of my spectral density, the Fourier coefficients have a certain property lead. In particular, the Fourier coefficients are absolutely summable. That's my condition over here. So that basically means as j the, um, goes to infinity, basically the Fourier coefficients goes to zero at a particularly fast rate. Okay, so this is my condition on my, uh, my, my um, 
on my, on my locations. Okay, so this is what we get, and so this is this is this is this is the result that we're looking for. We have the Fourier frequency at one one um, Fourier transform at one frequency omega k one, and the Fourier transform at another frequency omega k two, and the covariance between them is the spectral density, which is basically the Fourier transform, the covariance of the spatial protest, multiplied by a factor that really depends upon your sampling design. Okay, so that's basically what we have, plus some er extra errors. Okay, so this is the result that we get. So to look at some special cases, this means the variance of the Fourier transform is basically called the spectral density function, which is what we want, multiplied by this additional factor over here, which depends upon your sampling design. Okay, and the other thing is, and this is sort of important to us, is that if you look in the covariance at two different frequencies, that are quite far apart, we have that the, the, the correlation structure decays at the rate of, the, um, of the, frequent, the, the distance between the Fourier frequencies. So basically, the decay at the rate K1 minus K2. So if you're very far apart, then this is going to be very, very small. And then, of course, you have the error in, in these bounds over here. Okay, so that's what we have when you have just any general random design. When you have a, oops, when you have a specific design, then things get um, better. I want to add here that unlike time series, I'm looking at a grid, an RD, but I don't need to somehow specify. I don't have to sort of say truncate it to some 0 to 2 pi. I really can look at a grid on RD, because irregular sampling basically means that aliasing does not occur. Okay, so we can look at any frequency and we can identify that frequency. That, that's the, sort of the idea here. And this kind of goes back to a very interesting paper by Shapiro and Silverman in, from 1960 that says that when you have irregular sampling, then you can identify any frequency in a function. Okay, going back to a specific example, that your locations are uniformly sampled. So you can imagine sort of a Poisson process on there. There's a similar idea. So uniformly sampled on, on, on the, on the um, square, then your covariance between the DFT at two different, or Fourier transform at two different locations, is basically the variance is the spectral density plus some error. Okay, which depends upon the um, sampling frequency of 1 over lambda. And importantly, if you're at two different frequencies on that grid, you get something that's pretty much uncorrelated. In fact, it's 1 over lambda d minus b, and b is basically telling you how many zeros there are between you take the difference between k1 and k2. So it's a measure of distance between the two. So basically, that, that's kind of interesting. So really, the, on that grid, you have something that's pretty much uncorrelated. OK, so, so what does that mean when you have a spatial process and you look at the grid itself? We don't really lose any information by looking at this gridification. It's somehow the gridification is somehow the ideal way of looking at it. I must add here, in a very recent paper, Lahiri, with his collaborators, are looking at the Fourier transform, a regular sample data, um, for this type of data, to define the empirical likelihood. And in their setup, they're mm -hmm. using um, a gridification, but much wider frequencies. And there's a reason for that, but I can discuss the end of this talk over here. OK, so, so now we know how to define our Fourier transform. We can define, basically, our analogous version of the integrated periodogram. For what we had in time series, we can now apply it to spatial data. And so this is basically it. A little bit more complicated, but I'm making the complication for certain reasons over here. OK, so this is our weight function. This is our phi, but I've called it g over here. And it's user specified, depending on the parameter you want to estimate. This over here is our Fourier transform, and it's Fourier transform with some shift r. There's a reason for that, and I'll discuss in a second. Okay? So when r is set to 0, then what we have over here is simply the periodogram. And so you can imagine, okay, the periodogram is estimating the spectral density function. All right? So then to see what this is estimating using sort of heuristics, if we replace this now, or this thing over here, by the spectral density function, and the sum by an integral, what we see is Heuristically, this quantity here must be estimating the following functional, which is basically g omega spectral density d omega over the integral a over lambda um, squared. Okay? And if then we let a go to infinity at a faster rate than lambda is going to infinity, so that basically means if we choose a number of frequencies, or the frequency grid A to be much bigger than lambda, then we see that essentially this whole thing over here will correspond to this functional, functional spectral density. Okay, so that's basically, we kind of heuristically see maybe what this thing is estimating. So I want to look at a couple of examples. First, when A 
is on a bounded frequency grid, which basically means the ratio A over lambda does not increase to infinity as lambda goes to infinity. So there's reasons for that. So it's a bounded frequency grid. And then examples when we let A go to infinity at a much faster than lambda. So you, you're, we're estimating this quantity over here. So I want to look at the two cases, examples which belong to this class over here. So. First case is when we're on a bounded frequency grid, okay? Then, then essentially, there are sort of two examples I can think of which are of interest. When we basically keep A, the number of frequencies of order lambda. And that is the first one is the, the Whittle likelihood. And in, this is really a discrete phase version of the, the likelihood proposed by Matsuda and Yajima. And in this case over here, we have to keep the frequency grid bounded basically because we have this ratio in coming into play. And when you're now on a spatial random field, your spectrum is defined over R, or R to the D. So really, as omega, the frequency gets to infinity, your spectral density is going to infinity. So you have, you're inverting zero, essentially. So you need to keep your frequency gr gr bounded so that this is a well-defined um, property. Okay, so this is when the frequency is bounded. So you, you're not having this tail property. The other thing I can think of, which comes under this class, is the spectral density estimator, where really, you you have your periodogram and you take some sort of local average to estimate spectral density. This also comes under the class where the frequency kit is bounded. When the frequency is not bounded, you get more interesting estimators. One estimator that's kind of quite nice is that you can estimate non-parametrically the spatial covariance function. Okay, so you're assuming stationarity and you can estimate that um, spatial covariance function properly. Um, nicely, if you use exponential, your g is an exponential function. Mm -hmm. So then you get a nice estimate of exp um, the spatial covariance, but you need, in order to ensure that your estimator it corresponds to a covariance estimate, which is, non uh, non, um, sorry, which is a non-negative function, you need to multiply the sort of this um, weighted periodogram type thing by the triangle kernel. And basically what that means is when you take essentially the Fourier transform of this, you get a positive function. So that's really why you do it. So this is, gives you immediately very fast, completely very fast, an estimator which is um, positive definite in some sense. Another class of estimates one could look at is rather than look at the Whittle likelihood estimator, which is essentially a Kolbal Leiber um, distance, we look at basically a periodogram minus maybe um, the spec a, a parametric form of the spectrum and then take the L2 distance of this. Uh, this doesn't actually belong to what I described to you earlier, but using the asymptotics in this paper, I mean, what I described here, you can apply it to this thing over here. Moreover, when you want to get the sampling properties of lambda, theta, sorry, so when, of course, you find the theta which minimizes this L2 distance over here, they really depend on the derivative mm -hmm. of this L2 function, which does belong to the class of estimators I'm talking about. Okay, so this is sort of a motivation of why this estimator, to me at least, is interesting. And now I want to sort of, oh, and you might be wondering, why are we making the notation so cumbersome? Why, the, why enough I'm bothering by this R thing over here? The reason is twofold, and that's interesting to me. When the sampling is uniform, so remember, so when we're sampling, the, the, the sampling of the locations is uniform, we get some interesting properties. When R is not equal to zero, then essentially we have an estimator that asymptotically behaves like an ancillary variable to our estimator of interest. So these two things are sort of orthogonal but very interesting. This quantity when r is equal to zero contains information about the parameter of interest. Whereas this thing when r is not equal to zero it doesn't contain any information about the parameter of interest, but does contain information about this variance. It has the same variance as when r is not e equal to zero. So in some sense, you can do it for variance estimation. And that's what I do towards the end of this in talk over here. So that's, for me, what makes it interesting. And also, when r is not equal to zero, in the case that the locations are uniformly sampled, um, we have a sort of dichotomy going on. When, when it's stationary, this is estimating zero, essentially. And when it's non-stationary, then this is not estimating zero. So what we can do is you can use that sort of difference here to test for stationarity. But I'm not going to look at that in this talk. OK, so we, we have our estimators. Now we want to see, OK, is it estimating the uh, thing we want it to estimate? And it's, what's the variance look like? So first, what does the mean look like? So first, this is the, the functional of interest, or we can let A go to infinity if we want it to. So when we have uniform sampling, so the locations are uniformly sampled on lambda, then essentially the expectation of this, um, this statistic, when r is equal to zero, it looks complicated, but this is essentially estimating zero. 
okay, when r is equal to zero. When r is not equal to zero, it's estimating, essentially you see your, your, the expectation is estimating the parameter of interest, the integral spectral density. Okay, so this is, this is what's happening when the sampling is uniform. When the sampling is non-uniform, you get something more complicated. You see that now the expectation of what we have depends upon the parameter of interest multiplied by some sort of um, quantity sort of a, a that depends upon the sampling density. So basically, this thing over here is basically, uh, it's basically the inner product between the Fourier coefficients of the sampling, um, the sampling density multiplied by the, inner, um, the Fourier coefficients that shift r. So this is basically this thing over here. It's a, it's a nuisance, essentially, but it can be estimated in a, in a, a, a nice semi-parametric way. There are very nice procedures, one by Laurent, I think, in 1996, and actually a very nice procedure by Jeannie and Nicole in 2008 for estimating this type of quantity here. So it's, if we can estimate, if we can if we estimate the mean of this, then we have this by taking out this quantity over here. So it's not a disaster. Okay, now what we're going to do is, okay, we know that it's estimating sort of the, integrand, or the integral of interest, the function of interest, okay? So what's happening now when, um, um, what's the covariance? What's the covariance of this quantity going to look like? If the random field is Gaussian, you get this sort of nice property going on. Essentially, what we have is a, this is our standardization factor, lambda to the power of d, and we can show that the covariance, or you can think of it just as a variance of a statistic over here, is, um, is, is bounded when we multiply by lambda d over all the frequencies. So it doesn't matter how big a frequency we are, how many frequencies we're using in this construction of the estimate, it doesn't make, really play any role. Um, and it's also supreme over r1 and r2. So this thing over here is bounded. Um, but there are additional conditions which are kind of interesting. If we place additional, additional conditions on the spectral density functions, I haven't put the here because it's kind of technical, but we can place that, then we can obtain an explicit expression for the covariance or the variance between our statistic at two different uh, R1 and R2. Okay? It's, it looks a little bit obnoxious, so I, I apologize for that. So this is this, the thing that we, the covariance is going to be. Okay, plus an additional term, and this additional term over here is basically something that begins on log to the power of three a number of frequencies divided by lambda, and and this term looks l disgusting, but it's a kind of bias. Okay, if I wanted to remove that, it makes this term more disgusting, even more disgusting. Okay, but the good thing is, is that this is basically these things. This thing in certain situations can be estimated, so we have an expression for the variance. Um, Okay, now, now you might ask, what, what is this big gamma and what is this C over here? Well, big gamma, I told you, the location density plays a role in all this, and it's this thing over here. So the, sort of a sort of fourth order product, a third order product between the Fourier coefficients of spatial density. C, C is basically this functional of the spectral density squared. Remember, we're in the Gaussian setup, okay? So this, is, this kind of looks familiar. All right, and if you let the... Q be such that you know R1 and R2 are far away from each other, then, then these correlation will decay. There's this kind of thing. So the expressions are really disgusting, I accept. So let me look in the simplified situation where the sampling is uniform. In the case of sampling is uniform, okay, here's the real and the real parts of it. What we have is our estimator, maybe a, um, lag R1, and an estimator lag R2. If R1 and R2 are different to each other, they're pretty much uncorrelated if you have uniform um, sampling. But if, of course, the variance of this quantity now is just half CA over lambda. So this, this gamma function doesn't play a role, and so it's kind of nice, essentially. And these are, of course, the errors involved in that. Okay. And also, we have this, the real parts and the imaginary parts, they're uncorrelated asymptotically too. So, so this is kind of a summary of the statistic the signal properties. So what, what does that mean? You saw this sort of disgusting formulas. What does that mean to us? Well, this is our estimator, and maybe if we want our a frequencies to grow to our, a, our frequency grid to grow to infinity, in the Gaussian case, we have something kind of nice. Essentially, what it tells us is that this thing over here is estimating um, this, the functional integral from minus infinity to infinity, or an over R d. And, and the mean squared error depends from 1 over lambda d, lambda over a, okay, to the beta minus 1. This is sort of the bias over here. But a is a user-chosen parameter. It's the number of frequencies I'm using. 
Okay? So essentially, I can allow A to be as large as my computer allows me. Okay? And so when I allow that, this thing here goes, goes to zero, essentially. So if, you, if your computer is just super, then this thing over here can go to zero, and then we really have a, an estimate which is pretty much close to the mean squared error is pretty much close to 1 over lambda power of d. This is in the Gaussian case. doesn't matter how big you choose your a to b, which is kind of nice. But if you want to get a variance, you want to measure the amount of uncertainty, then you need to place some constraints on, on how big you let a go to infinity. Okay? And, and essentially what it is, I d these are sufficient conditions, but when I go through the proofs, I can't see how to make it much better in that case over there, we need to, it's, it's not a big constraint, but we need to choose A such as order lambda to the power of k for any k bigger than 1. <laughs> so it can grow very, very fast, I think. So these are basically, these are the conditions in the Gaussian case. What I want to emphasize is that things change quite dramatically when the random field is non-Gaussian. Okay? When the random field is non-Gaussian and you try to work out the variances, the covariances of our statistic, you have basically the term that's due to the covariance. I'm looking specifically now at uniform sampling, just because the expressions are nicer. That, that's all. The same results also hold in non-uniform sampling. That we have basically, if you're looking at the variance of this quantity, so the real part of this thing, you can imagine just r being zero, and then you don't have to look at the real part. It's just that the variance of this quantity here. This here is due to the to the, the Gaussian term I just gave you. So some sort of integral of special density squared. This term over here is pretty disgusting, but if you're familiar with time series and all the spectral analysis there, it's simply a Fourier transform of the fourth order spectral density function. And then we have the additional term, which is the same as the Gaussian. That's just the error due to the Gaussian approximations. And then we have something additional. And this term, however much you might sit there looking at the proof you just cannot get rid of, is basically interaction between a number of frequencies, lambda to the power of d over n squared. Okay, which means now how we let our frequency grow to go to infinity is somehow controlled by lambda and the number of frequencies n. Okay, so let me kind of summarize what we see over here. The addition of this extra term, this sort of functional spectral density, just comes as no surprise for anyone familiar with time series. That always happens, you know, it's our fourth order spectral density. Ugh. But the addition of this extra term over here, a lambda power of d over n squared, which is a sort of interaction between these three terms over here, is a surprise. And this really comes about because you have an interaction going on between the fourth order cumulant and the random sampling. It's a and, and if you look at it, you cannot get better than that. Okay, you cannot order it. And that means in order to ensure that this does not explode, you need to, in pla oops, need to place um, a quite a strong condition on the number of frequencies you're using. So basically, a number of frequencies you're using in the definition of your estimator cannot be... Um, um, cannot grow faster than n to, power, n to the power of 2 over d over lambda. This cannot happen. If you do, you'll have an exploding variance. You're no longer getting a mean squared consistent estimator. So in some sense, you really need to um, sort of control the number of frequencies used, and typically you need to let sort of a equal n to the power of 1 over d. And there can be some problems in this setup, of course, when you do the different type of asymptotics. So if we go from pure in, uh, mixed asymptotics to pure increasing asymptotics, there can be some properties, but there are some remedies for this situation um, using the approach given by Lahiri and his collaborators. Okay, quickly, central limit theorem. Um, now, this is... I'm looking now strictly at the Gaussian case. So in order to show normality in the Gaussian case, you have to do play with cumulants, which is very, very painful, but you can show that the cumulants of higher orders decays at a sufficiently fast rate, which basically gives us a central limit theorem. We have our estimator of interest minus the mean converges in distribution to um, a normal distribution, mean zero, and this variance over here. Okay, so, so we have a central limit theorem over here. Okay, so that, that's kind of useful for us. Um, um, in the case that the locations, I mean, so in case of space, the random field is non-Gaussian, I think that it's possible to also show a central limit theorem under some sense of types of mixing conditions. Um, I suspect there seems to be a paper that's cited by Schumann Lahiri, but I cannot get hold of it, even if I beg for him, where he's proved something for random fields, um, and I suspect the same proof could go through in, in my case over here. But 
And, and so I'm not even bothering trying to prove it for the case of mixing over here. Um, but of course, when you don't, we drop the assumption of Gaussianity, now you have to be very careful about how you choose a frequency good. You, you cannot have this sort of leverage that we're having in, in, the, in the Gaussian case over here. What I want to emphasize, just, I'm guessing I'm getting close to my time, aren't I? Yeah, okay, very fast. What I emphasize here is that this variance is pretty disgusting and, and, and it's unpleasant. And if you actually code this, you have to somehow estimate it. So what I want to do is briefly explain to you um, how you can estimate this variance in a certain situation. So during the 1930s, Fisher introduced the notion of an ancillary variable. And so basically, this is a set of statistics whose distribution does not depend upon the parameter of interest. Okay? So for example, you're trying to, in the Gaussian case, you're trying to estimate the mean mu, so you could look at the centralized statistic, which is xi minus x bar, the distribution of this doesn't depend on the mean mu. So this is the idea of ancillary. Um, in our case, in, in time series and in spatial data, and, and the idea of ancillary is not used very much. I mean, it doesn't have much utility. But the Fourier transform that I'm describing to you, in some sense, behaves like an ancillary variable, or asymptotically so. So the idea is, in the case of uniform sampling, can we use that to estimate the variance in a, in a very fast, computationally consistent way? So the idea here is that we have our statistic at r is equal to 0, which, is the, which estimates a parameter of interest and are not equal to zero, whose mean is pretty much, um, whose mean is zero, asymptotically zero, and at different r's, they're uncorrelated. Moreover, if you keep few of the r's pretty much fixed, you get the central limit theorem. And it doesn't matter what this quantity is, what you have is they all share pretty much the same variance. And they're all asymptotically uncorrelated. So in, in terms of a central limit theorem, they converge to a normal distribution with mean zero and, and identity over here. So what we have is so statistics over here, they look kind of useless, contain no mean information whatsoever, but all share the same variance. So then you might ask yourself, can I estimate my variance using the R's which are not equal to zero? All right, so basically what you do is at zero, this is my statistic of interest, and R's around it, are uh, basically S, uh, statistics have mean asymptotically zero. They're pretty much uncorrelated, but also share the same variance. So you just look at the sample variance of these quantities over here, and you don't need to subtract the mean because it has a mean asymptotically zero. And you use this as our estimate of the statistic, st statistic over here. And you can show that this consistently estimates the variance in both the Gaussian case and the non-Gaussian case. So even in the non-Gaussian case, you have this fourth order spectral density coming into play, it can still consistently estimate that term over here. So what we have now is when you want to construct your statistic, you look at the centralized version of your estimator over here. So there's your estimator, you centralize it over here. Remember, we're working on the uniform, um, we're assuming in uniformity, and divide by our pseudo estimate of the variance. And because we have this property that they're all uncorrelate to each other, and this asymptotic goes to normal, if we keep m fixed, the number we're using in our constructing our estimator, it converges to a t distribution. I haven't got the date, um, these simulations here, but it works relatively well. Okay, so this means that we can use it for we can use this statistic for testing construction of confidence intervals. Um, so, how much time do I have? Um, minus two. So I guess okay, so there we are. I've, I've got minus two. Um, okay, I think I'm boring my audience to death. So, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, briefly, very epsilon briefly on this. Okay, so you might want to, so how you do all the proofs? Oh, we well, probably not, you're probably saying, please shut up now. But if you were wondering how, how to do the proofs, everything depends upon, of course, we have our Fourier transforms at different frequencies, and in the uniform case, and d is equal to one, you know that if the frequency is the same, S may spectral density functions, frequency difference is of one over lambda, Returning to our statistic, we want to estimate this quantity over here. Um, and our aim is to show in, in uniform sampling that if r is equal to zero, we get something, r is not equal to zero, we get something asymptotically zero, and r is not equal to zero, we estimate the functional interest. Okay, that's kind of nice. But if the number of a, the a frequency grid or the frequency grid is kept fixed, you can just use this and put it in there and you get the result. If it's not, then you have to use some you have to use classical examples to do use, similar to those that we use in time series, but in time series we play around with Dirichlet kernels, here you play around with sync functions, and you get pretty much similar answers. So this is kind of the method of proof, but I, I'm sure you want to go and have your coffee right now, so I'm, I'll leave you to it. If you want details, I, I can tell you afterwards, okay? <laughs> okay, so thanks a lot. <laughs>